I'm Adam Lawrence, and today we're joined by a very special guest, Julia Carpenter. Julia Carpenter is an award-winning journalist for the Wall Street Journal, where she writes about how we make money decisions. She's worked for several other prominent media publications and has led social media strategies on Tumblr, Snapchat, and other emerging platforms. She's also reported on culture, tech, and more for places like New York Magazine and Vogue. Welcome, Julia. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, usually, you know, I like to start off with the bio, but could you also tell us an interesting fact about yourself that's not in your bio? Absolutely. And whenever this question comes around the table, I have one fun fact I've been sharing since I was like 23. I need to really think about updating it, but I'm actually a black belt in Taekwondo. Wow. Wow. I love that. And how long have you been doing Taekwondo for? I haven't done it now in several years. I'm really resting on my laurels. I'm afraid that's why I need a new one back. That's awesome. Well, I love that. Um, well, great. So today I was hoping we could discuss this article that you wrote back in January for the journal. It was really fascinating and it caught my eye. Um, it was about the increasing number of parents that are now supporting their adult children financially. And it, it really drew my attention because that's something that's been coming up more and more frequently in my conversations as a financial advisor with clients. And so, you know, in the article, you start this recent Pew Research Center study reporting that 59% of parents have financially helped their adult children in the past year alone. So how do you think through this increasing financial dependence that children are having on their parents? Well, the origin of the story was anecdotal. I would be talking to people, talking with editors at the journal and talking with sources who were describing this phenomenon that people all of a sudden bought a house. And when you ask them, wow, how are you able to do that in this economy? They say, well, I mean, my parents gifted us the down payment. Or you ask someone, wow, you lost your job. How are you making it through? And they say, my parents are giving me a little bit of help. And there's so much shame around this topic and so much embarrassment that once I was able to find this data, both with Pew and then with uh, Professor Ripple and her data, I I realized just how prevalent this was and how little we talk. Yeah, absolutely. And, and like I mentioned, you talked to some real Americans about this very, very relevant topic that's hitting home for a lot of them. Um, and two of them were Cammy and Adam, not me, but a different Adam, uh, which are a 39 year old couple who needed help on a 10% down payment for a new home in Queens, New York, and ended up receiving the money from Cammy's mom. Um, thankfully, she ended up coming through on that end. So, as someone who lives in New York themselves, what did you feel when you first heard their story? Their story is so interesting because there is a cultural difference that really informed Cammie's mom's uh, assistance as well. So Cammie and her mom both immigrated from the former Soviet Union. Adam, her husband, grew up in Texas. And Cammie's mom feels very strongly that if she has the ability to help financially her daughter and their uh, her grandchild and her son-in-law, she will do so. And she did so. You know, she had previously been a guarantor on some of their past leases. She helped them in the house hunt. She obviously helped them with this down payment that was so important to them getting into this apartment and starting their home there. Adam grew up in Texas with kind of this culture of rugged individualism. He describes that growing up, he was told when you turn 18, that's it. You're out of the house. Good luck. We'll talk later. And it was interesting to see how they, as a couple, talked about this and talked about the feelings and emotions that came with Kimmy's mom helping. I mean, definitely as someone who lives in New York myself, I had a connection to the story and that they were telling me how they made this happen. And I had a million follow-up questions that don't need to be in the story because they're just like nosy questions about New York real estate. But so often, I mean, real estate across the country, so often it's about being competitive. I talked to so many people who have saved money for a down payment, who have saved a huge chunk of change or have good financials, but they can't be competitive when someone is sweeping in with an all-cash offer or someone else is offering more or someone else has no contingencies. And having that parent and that, or even just that third person offering that financial assistance so you can be competitive makes all the difference. For sure. And yeah, and I think that the thing that is really surprising for a lot of folks is that when interest rates went up, they thought they would 
you know, that that would put some downward pressure on home prices and maybe work out more possible for them to, you know, buy the home. But in a lot of cases, there, there's such a, a an undersupply of homes that the prices actually went up in a lot of cases at the same time that the interest rates and therefore the mortgage payments were going up. So it makes a lot of sense that to stay competitive, they oftentimes were forced to ask their parents for help. Um, and so in that same regard, you know, when I first looked in the, uh, this whole situation, my initial intuition was that adult children must be receiving more financial support just by getting a larger number of dollars, let's say, or simply bigger checks from their parents than they were in the same situations decades ago. But in real research, did you end up finding that to be the case? No. So, so it's not that people are receiving more money from their parents. It's that they're receiving it for longer periods of time. So previously, because this has always happened, right? Like this has always happened. We just don't, again, maybe have the data or have talked about it. It's not like this is a new phenomenon that parents financially assist adult children. What's happening now is that there was a period of time, early 20s, early 30s, maybe a little bit later, maybe a little bit earlier, when parents would be financially assisting their adult children once they are transitioning to full-time work, graduating from school, um, getting that first apartment, getting that first house, starting a family. These were sort of the milestones at which we saw people receiving this help. Now, that because that help isn't going as far as it once did, it you sort of stay on the payroll, as one of my colleagues called it, stay on the payroll for longer. So you see, rather than you get in that first house that your parents sort of helped you buy, and then that's it, you get in that first house, and then they're also helping with the grandchild's tuition. They're helping with childcare. They're helping with the repair on the house. They're helping with the second house. All of these things that previously were once much more financially accessible that are now much more. Absolutely. And inflation, you know, going skyrocketed you know through the roof in the last few years certainly hasn't helped that situation um and you know one thing i sort of just I, I feel like when i've seen the situation is you know whenever a kid graduates from college and then they start living at home it may make it more likely that they'll be on the payroll for longer um whenever they you know are actually in the home and you know it's it's like you're, you're not just not being independent physically but actually it's like it's like a mental thing too right um so, you know, there's a stigma whenever you're living at home with your parents. And I know that you talked to a 33-year-old physical therapist named Heather in the story. And I'm curious what you learned from talking to her. Heather had a, an arrangement with her parents. She would live at home. She wouldn't pay rent for living at home. But she would contribute groceries. She would contribute other items to the household. They had worked out what she needed while she was paying down her debt and getting started with her physical therapy career. Talking to other people, that seems pretty standard. It's not often that you would move home and your parent would start charging you rent for the room that you are now occupying or charging you for room and board. Instead, there's an arrangement that you work out with the agreement that this is a temporary situation and you will then be transitioning out of uh, this, this period of time will be a transitional period is maybe what I'm trying to say. And what's really interesting from the Pew data is how the adult children who have this arrangement, they, it has hugely benefited their personal finances, that they were able to save money during this period, that they were able to pay down debt. And they feel overall very positive about that. And the parents don't necessarily see a negative or positive impact on their personal finances, but they see a positive impact on the relationship. So it's a really interesting period of time. And now that we're seeing it happen later and at different stages of life rather than that uh, post-college, pre-full-time job period of time, I'm super curious what other data we will see and what other anecdotes people will share. Me, me too, 100%. And that was one of the things that was honestly the most surprising to me. So most parents are saying, you know, it, it's, you know, really beneficial for the relationship. Um, with their children, around 18% of parents saying it's negative for their own financial situation. 64% of the kids are saying it's beneficial, which is not surprising. You know, their parents are helping them out. But only 21% said that living with their parents has positively impacted their social life. And in fact, 24% said that living at home has negatively impacted their social life. So it's clear that while living at home may 
you know, improve their finances as a young adult. It's not going to do the same thing for their social life necessarily. It's probably, you know, not great for finding a significant other or for making friends. And, you know, you, you, you bring them home for drinks and then your parents are at home. Um, and so it shows that not all ways of receiving that parental financial support are created equal, i.e. if you were to be, you know, receiving those comments and you were to be living elsewhere on your own. Yeah. So you also drove home another key point I loved, which is setting limits on financial help. And, you know, when this conversation comes up, it's usually always centered around the child and how much they need, right? Because they're the focus of the conversation. But what's commonly left out and something I think about as a, you know, financial advisor that mainly works with, you know, retirees is that many of these parents helping out their children are are retired and they're in their 60s or even 70s and they're living on fixed income and with rising inflation and worries of recession potentially around the corner only 77 percent of retirees now say that they have enough funds to cover their expenses down from 83 percent in 2020. so it's such an important conversation to have with my clients especially those that are financially supporting their own kids that they have to realize that they've got to take care of themselves first and i'm curious how you think about that conversation a colleague of mine, her name is Veronica Dagger. She wrote a follow-up story to my story specifically about cutting your kids off. And it's a really great read. I highly recommend you check it out. One of the things that came up when I was interviewing people for this story as well is how both sides, both the adult children and the parents, if there's not an agreement about this help, they feel uncomfortable about it. So parents feel like, they don't, they don't have the full picture of their kids' financial lives, so they want to help how they can. And also, really interesting in that data from Professor Ripple, it's not only affluent parents who are doing this. It's also low-income parents who are doing this. People are wanting to help how they can, whether it be a large amount or a small amount. They, it, it's something that they're doing regardless of their own socioeconomic status. But one of the things that was interesting from hearing the children's perspective is I spoke with a financial advisor who said, She's, she's heard from children who say, I feel like this money is unpredictable. I don't want to count on it because I'll receive this gift from my parents or they'll help with one thing. They won't help with another. We haven't formalized this arrangement and it feels kind of scary to know, I oh my God, my parents just gave me $1,000, but there's some sort of contingency that I know they have, whether it be visiting more, visiting with the grandchildren more. Um, I spoke with one couple who said, you know, the implication, I think, in gifting us this money for the down payment is, and then when we are older, we'll come live with you, you know? And so it's all of these yeah. sort of unspoken things on both sides. And with the parents, to your point, one of the unspoken things is I'm sacrificing my personal financial health for you. So what's going to happen with that? We don't, they, they sort of leave it open. And sometimes that means the child will be the one who is taking care of them in retirement. Sometimes it means the child will be financially responsible for them later in life. But none of that is actually said out loud. And that's where that situation gets awkward and at times straight up toxic. 100%. And, you know, when we think about, especially because, you know, I feel like for the longest time, you know, the research shows that parents have been helping their parents for decades financially, right? But now it comes down to a lot bigger purchases that they're helping with, like the down payment. So, you know, whenever whenever you research that area of parents helping their kids with the down payment, what did you learn in that area? And what was it, um, you know, different from what you expected to find? The down payment is definitely the big conversation topic in this because buying a home is the American dream, but it's so hard to do right now, especially for younger people. We see people buying their first home at later and later ages. You brought up low inventory. The starter home inventory is at an all-time low. I've written that story. Other people have written that story. It's really difficult. So helping with the down payment is very common. The National Association of Realtors tracks that. It's something uh, like more than half of people who are buying their first time home are doing so with help from their parents and mostly around the down payment, right? Amassing that huge amount of money, again, to my point earlier, remaining competitive. One of the things that, again, is interesting about this is that there are rules. You know, the IRS has a gifting rule. Um, oftentimes mortgage payments are, you have, to, you have to disclose for the gift letter or these other things. So again, formalizing that arrangement and making it visible and explicit is in the best interest of everyone, both legally and for tax purposes. 
Absolutely. And, you know, that's a point that I really want to touch on, you know, going back to the mortgage payment, because, you know, we talk about there, there is a dichotomy, right, between how families from different socioeconomic backgrounds are helping out their kids. So oftentimes in the case of, um, let's say, middle class or or poorer families, they may just be giving the cash outright, whereas wealthier families are turning into more of a bank, right? That was, you know, how you sort of turned it in the article. And they're actually writing a mortgage to their kids, just like a bank would. Um, and so, um, you know, again, like, how does this factor into this entire conversation? And how are the folks that you talk to, how do they feel differently about when they get a mortgage from their parents versus an outright down payment? I really want to interview actual people who have done this. I've interviewed uh, Tim Burke from National Family Mortgage a handful of times. I include him in the story. He has a lot of experience with this. I'm so interested to talk to some of his clients because the structure of the agreement is really interesting. And you're right. They are, it is a literal bank of mom and dad, not just hypothetically, but a literal bank of mom and dad. Tim and his colleagues set up the mortgage that way. I'm very, so one of, one of the reasons this is kind of catching on is because of interest rates, right? You can set the interest rate with your parents, maybe get more money from your parents than you would from the bank more uh more affordable terms than you can live it from the bank but again it's from your parents so it's, it's a very interesting situation i want to do way more research on it talk to way more people about it for, for sure yeah I, and I'll, I'll be definitely looking out for those articles because i'm curious on that too um you know how this is looking on in, in real people's households because you know especially as a cpa i don't look at the irs rules right and there's there's a lot of math behind it um and so you know of course, when you're doing a loan like this to your kids, you want to make sure that it's in line with the minimum interest rates that the IRS sets to not um, violate the gift rules, right? Because if it's under a certain interest rate, it's like, hey, you're basically giving yourself an outright gift to your kids. And it's a lot easier to violate those rules now that interest rates have gone way up because those mi minimum interest rates that the IRS sets have gone up themselves. Um, so that's that point is certainly well taken. Um, and, and, you know, with that being said, it, whenever you're, you know, not just giving the down payment outright, but now you're having to formalize these agreements or having to do mortgages, things become a lot more complicated and the situations are a lot more likely to get kind of dicey, right? Um, because what if your kids don't pay you back? What if they, it, and it's not just about, they don't want to pay you back, but what if they literally can't? And so um, one situation that caught my eye was the one of May and William Chow. And so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Definitely. So May and William bought their house with help from both William's sisters and his mother in Queens. And one of the reasons I so I interviewed May and included her voice in the story for this. One of the reasons they were able to get this house is because of that help. They were able to wait to sell William's apartment in order to then move into the house. So otherwise, there would have been this awkward period of time where they were waiting to sell the apartment. Maybe they'd lose out on the house. Maybe they'd be renting somewhere in between. It just wouldn't have worked. So because they had this, this money, they were able to do so. Their situation is, I almost said so unique, but it's not. It's actually, it's very common. And it's what makes it interesting to me is that speaking with May, I was able to get her perspective on someone who is doing this with in-laws, which is, I, I, I think, incredible. <laughs> It's so relatable immediately. As soon as I say in-laws and money, people sort of back up a little like this. And it was interesting to hear her perspective because she sort of took, I don't want to say she took a back seat, but she let her husband steer the ship on this because it was his family and because he had the connection and would be able to set up that arrangement with his family. So it's, there's, there's agreements you have to make, of course, when you're borrowing money from in-laws or receiving money from in-laws that uh, you have to have that question mark of, okay, well, where does this money go if we break up? Where does this money go if we get divorced? And that's something that all the experts I talked to in the story said you have to do on the front end as uncomfortable as that can seem. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And in that particular story, I thought it was really interesting how, so the, the couple, May and William, they were getting help from not just William's mom, but from his sisters as well. Um, and so they ended up, after they, you know, sold the house, they were able to pay back the sisters, um, but they weren't able to pay back William's mom. So they ended up keeping her name on her deed on the house. And I thought that was really interesting because 
and 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 apparently may well i'm sure that they were more than happy to do that because she you know she had helped and had enabled them to get the house in the first place but i mean would right. would you be comfortable doing that with your own in-laws i mean i just feel like no. <laughs> it would be a nightmare for most people i would not absolutely not but again i don't know it's so situational like you know maybe if it was the perfect house right maybe if it was the perfect time in my life maybe if but i don't know i don't know big question mark for me don't know if i could do that yeah yes yeah, same here same here and so you know whenever you wrote the story you know you covered so many different areas of this of this topic and you talked to so many different people what would you say surprised you the most and what didn't surprise you all that much the comments and the feedback and the emails were really interesting. I was expecting way more hate, to be honest, way more pushback, way more what's wrong with these kids? Why can't they do this themselves? Instead, I got much more response of this is our situation too. This is my life. This is, I, I really want to write a follow up story about this for that reason. Um, so it seems to be so much more common than we are discussing and so much so much of the shame and embarrassment that I had mentioned at the top, that's still there too. You know, it, it hasn't gone away with it becoming more prevalent, which I think is so fascinating. For sure, for sure. And, you know, something I think about, um, you know, I feel like it's also different for different cultures, right? So what I've found, you know, for my friends, you know, especially a lot of my Indian friends, let's say, um, it's, it's, you know, oftentimes common for older family members, you know, to come in and you know, live in the home whenever they're, you know, older age. And there's no shame or embarrassment around that. In American culture, it, you know, oftentimes people prefer, you know, living elsewhere or, you know, keeping the parent in their home with a caretaker if they're older or a nursing home. And so it's, it's, I, I'd also be curious to see about how this differs for di different cultures that there may be more shame and embarrassment, like you said, you know, like, um, you know, Adam, you know, raised in Texas, right? He was someone on your parents or like, hey, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get out of the house at 18 years of age. Whereas, you know, other cultures may help out and there may not be as much of a social stigma. So um, I think that that's really interesting as well. But it's 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 clear to me, you know, from, from writing about this, you know, personal finance is not just part of your job, but also something that you really want to It seems like a passion. Is that is that right? I I feel very strongly about the transparency of it all. And I think one of the things with money that we don't do is be transparent. You know, there are so many people who feel that they have to sort of follow up a particular path, hit certain benchmarks, reach certain milestones. And if they're not doing it like everybody else is doing it, that means they're failing. And I think when someone is transparent about well, I'm, I'm doing it this way because this is important to me, but it's also really important to my parents. Or I'm doing this, but I can do this because I actually make a ton of money at my job and I got a really good bonus. Or someone saying, I'm not doing this because actually I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of debt and I'm trying to pay down this and that's really important to me. All of us being more transparent about that, I think makes us all happier. And I'm very passionate about the pay transparency of it. I'm very passionate about salary transparency. I think it would behoove us all. 100 percent and uh, you know the other thing i was thinking about it, because it seems like such a passion it really shows right because you don't just do this yeah you don't just do this for a job but i also saw that you have a new book out called the new rules of money a playbook for planning your financial future and it's a workbook so i'm curious what made you want to create this workbook and what's the idea behind it it published december 5th and we have been getting great response I co-wrote the book with Bray Lamb. She is my former editor and uh, now deputy editor at the Wall Street Journal. We were inspired to create this book because we had seen so much of what I was talking about earlier. This sort of lack of transparency, this feeling that you have to follow a particular set of steps in order to achieve success. And if you aren't interested in those steps or if they aren't working for you too bad those are the steps and one of the things that really inspired us was cookbooks we thought about how recipe development uh 
food prep, meal planning, all these different things that are so appealing in a cookbook can be appealing in a personal finance workbook. Chores aren't fun. No one likes paying bills. No one likes reviewing the credit card statement. But there's ways to do it that feel accessible to someone who has done it a million times and someone who's never done it before. So that's that's so much of the motivation behind the book that we created. That's awesome. I, I love that idea. And I, I thought the workbook was was really well done. And um, I'm wondering what what is the best way for our viewers to use the workbook in the way it was intended so they can really get the most out of it? Oh, great question. No one's asked me that yet. I really have been so encouraged to get photos and videos from readers and friends who are doing it with someone else, who are sitting down with their partner and working through it together, or who are trading it back and forth with a friend or a roommate. I think that's a really interesting way to approach it. You're holding yourself accountable. You're talking it out. You're uh, hearing from someone else and able to bounce around ideas. You know, so much of the book, especially the beginning, is really asking for your perspective and your input. We wanted to make it a workbook and not a textbook because you can fill in the blanks with your numbers, your goals, your values, your thoughts. We include journal pages so that there's sort of a reset after a tough exercise or a really fun exercise, letting you sort of get everything in your head out and make it an emotional experience, but also a fun, hopefully fun and maybe sometimes humorous experience. We have a great illustrator. Her name is Jess Cronin, and there are some really fun jokes in the book that I think hopefully lighten the mood, but also make it more approachable. That's awesome. Well, I, I, I think it was really well done, and I encourage all of our viewers to go out and get it on Amazon and wherever they buy their books. Um, and, you know, I, I really will start do you have our final thoughts to share with our viewers as we as we close out the show here? Well, thank you so much again for having me. I and thank you so much for your kind words about the book and also about my stories. Um, so often writing is such a solitary activity, you know. And the reason I love being a reporter is because I love talking to people. I love interviewing people. I love actually hearing real people's stories. So everybody, if anybody has a question or a question about the book, question about stories, anything, you can reach out to me on email or find me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Julia C. Carpenter and all this. Awesome. Well, Julia, thank you so much for your time today. It's really been a fascinating conversation and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.